initially, um, lots of people will, will say to you, you know, did you read lots of books when you, when you were a young boy, that kind of thing. Well, uh, I, have to, I have to hold my hands up and confess that I was not a great reader when I was, when I was a young boy. I did read, but what I tended to read were things like um, the DC comics, uh, Marvel comics, um, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, all that kind of thing. I absolutely adored those sorts of things. And I was introduced to reading, really, by a very good teacher um, at school. Uh, one day I, I got into a trouble in, a, in, a, in an English lesson. I was just sitting in the lesson and our teacher was reading to us from Shakespeare, who of course is a very famous English author um, and uh, all American kids are, at some point are going to get introduced to Shakespeare. And I was just sitting in the class and I was a little bored and I was twiddling my thumbs round and round like this. And my teacher came up to me and closed his book, came round behind me and he didn't hit me with the book but he sort of went bang above my head like that. I jumped about 30 feet into the air, you know, and he said to me, he said, can't you do anything but twiddle your thumbs like that boy, you know, kind of thing. And I was very cheeky. I said, yes, sir, I can twiddle my thumbs like that. I went the other way around, you know. So, of course, I got a nice detention for that. And if you got a detention at school, you were always sent to the library for punishment. Now, librarians hate this story, of course, because, you know, the library is not a place of punishment. So he, uh, he sent me off to the library. And there was uh, a particular teacher on duty that day who was kind of half teacher, half librarian sort of thing. And his, his punishment was to make you read for an hour. And he sat me down and he said, right, you're going to read for an hour. But you were not allowed to read the book of your choice. You had to read the book of his choice. So he sat me down and, as I say, he put a book in front of me. And we always talk about not judging a book by its cover. Um, but he put a book down in front of me that had a picture of a woman in a lacy bonnet and a long flowing gown on and all that kind of thing. And I was 14 years old and I looked at this cover and I so, sort of went, no way, <laughs> I'm not going to read that. He said, well, you're here for an hour, you read it, and you know, tell me what you think. Um, and it, it was Pride and Prejudice. Uh, so I read the first few pages of Pride and Prejudice, and I actually got hooked onto the story. And he said to me, if you like the story, why don't you take it out and read it? And I said, if I take that out, I'll be beaten up by my mates. No one's going to like that kind of thing. So, um, but I did, I hid it in my bag, I took it, I read it came back and he introduced me to many, many other things and, and eventually actually on to fantasy. I read the Tolkien books of course and lots of boys and girls will say to me, what's your favourite book that you've ever read? And my favourite book is still The Hobbit and of course what's on the front cover of The Hobbit? A lovely big dragon guarding his treasure. My everyday life now is that I am in fact a full-time author now. Um, I, I gave up uh, working um, full-time in, in, in another job um, about three years ago. I began my life, I, I, I did a science degree. I, I wanted to do music and English when I was uh, at school uh, as, a, as a higher uh, educational subject and my tutors said to me, no, you're far better at science, you should go into, into science and they pushed me into, into science and I ended up doing a science degree so of course ultimately I, I, I had a science job as well. And I worked as a technician, a kind of glorified technician, at a university um, in Leicester. And I ran a microscope facility, which was a really very interesting job to do because lots and lots of people from all sort of different walks of life in the university would come in. So I would see clinical specimens and I would see geological specimens, biological specimens, all kinds of things. Met all sorts of interesting people. Great job. Um, and I did that for 28 years. And uh, 28 years, as you know, to do one job is, is more than enough, you know, usually. And I, for most of that time, I was sitting in a darkened room, um, just looking down a, a microscope or sort of putting things together on a computer and all that kind of stuff. And it was a good job. I, I liked the job. But I'd always had this creative streak in me. The music thing was always there with me. It was very big with me. I wrote many, many songs all the way through my 20s and 30s. I still do write songs. In fact, if you go onto my website, you can hear a couple of songs on the website. And um, I kind of switched over from songwriting into uh, having a go at story writing in my 30s. And I was at the university in those days. And what I used to do was write in my tea breaks. Um, and we're going back to the days now and the kids sort of looking at this will not believe that we only had one computer in, in my whole department in the university. It was thought one computer would be enough, would serve us enough, you know, and of course it's like one computer on every desk now. And I used to go to a room, I had two tea breaks in the day, half an hour tea breaks, 
and I would go to the, um, to the computer room and I would sit down. I'd always been fascinated by IT and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd sit down and I'd tap away at my story and then I'd get up and leave it and that's it. And for a long time, all I ever did was write for an hour a day. And then, of course, I was able to get a computer at home. I, I never liked writing longhand. You know, I could never, I'd never do that. Um, and then I got one at home, and then, of course, I would spend a couple of hours at home every night after I came home from work and that kind of thing. Uh, and for 14 years, I actually balanced the two. I, I was published, I think, uh, I, I think I had about 10 years to go at the university when I was, when I was published, maybe eight. Um, and I just sort of, sort of kept the two going side by side, but eventually the books became um, more, you know, they began to take over, and as they became more and more successful, people were beginning to ask me to do school visits more and more, and, and festivals, and, and all that kind of thing. And I just couldn't keep the, the balance. And eventually we took the plunge, and I sort of decided, this is it, and I'm going to have a go. And, and I left about three years ago. It's basically thank you, America, beca because it was the American sales of the books that allowed me to, to really give up the day job. Um, and come and do lovely things like this for you guys. <laughs> People will often get onto this subject by asking me who my literary heroes were. And uh, as I said earlier, I, I didn't really start reading until I was quite late, until I was sort of 14. Um, and although I love the books that I read, I wouldn't say anyone really introduced me to, to writing. I, there was no passion, no desire to write from that. You know, if, if certain authors were here, they would say, I've been reading, sorry, I've been writing ever since I could pick up a pen uh, and that kind of thing, and I read everything in sight, and that, that wasn't me. Music was the thing for me. I, I had three ambitions when I was growing up. One was to be a soccer player. One was to be um, an astronaut, <laughs> very fine American tr tradition. Um, and the other thing uh, that I would have loved to have been was a pop star, a rock star, something like that. Um, the, only, the only problem to that ambition was that um, I wasn't a great musician, um, and I certainly can't sing. <laughs> and if you go onto the website and listen to the songs, you'll know. Um, so I thought, I know, I'll do the next best thing. I, I, will, I will try to write songs. So I did. And my literary heroes, if I had any, would have been um, a little pop group called The Beatles, which I'm sure you've heard of. And I must tell you a nice couple of little stories about, about The Beatles. I, I was down in Florida at the start of my tour, and um, uh, there was a little girl there. She was about nine years old. She got a Beatles T-shirt on. And I saw the T-shirt, and she said, she said, do you like my T-shirt? And I said, yeah, it's great, you know, the Beatles. And she said, yes. She said, I wore this to make you feel at home, <laughs> which was great. And a boy stuck his hand up at the same time. He said, Mr. DeLacy, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, what's that? He said, are the Beatles your favorite band? And I said, uh, well, probably, yes, over a period of time. And he said, I thought so, he said all old people like the Beatles. <laughs> so, so that was great. And so of course I grew up with John Paul George and Ringo and many, many bands from the 60s, and that kind of thing. And songwriting was a great thing. And I, enjoy, I found I could do it. I, I, I enjoyed it. I liked the creative aspect of it. Uh, much like computing in a sense. You know, I like the, the creative aspect of, of using the computing language, languages to create something much bigger. Um, and for a long time, of course, I just thought that was, that was it, that's what I was going to do. If I can write songs and I can publish songs and I can do all that, I can be in bands and so on. But it never quite happened for me. That, that sort of pathway never took off. And I, I wouldn't say I got tired of writing songs, but I just wanted to try something different. I think creative people are always looking to sort of express their creativity in, in all sorts of ways. So writing was the next obvious thing to do. And, and I switched over in, in my early 30s. Uh, I found it very hard at first, really difficult at first. Um, I was always scrunching up paper and throwing it across the room. And, uh, and then when I got onto the computer, I found it a little easier because I could sort of go back and start editing things you know, quickly. Um, and that's, that's how it came about. So music, in a lyrical sense, I think, led, you know, led me into um, writing, crafting stories, because a, a song is, uh, I mean, okay, there are many different types of songs, but it, if you can write, a, create a story within, you know, that short space, rather like poetry, of course, um, then you're halfway to understanding how to structure a story um, and stuff. So that was that. Was that. 
<laughs> Strangely, what, w there's quite a long sort of complex uh, evolutionary history to the Dragon Books, and it really begins with me right at the start of my writing career, wanting to write a story for my wife for Christmas. I had bought a, um, a stuffed animal, a uh, stuffed animal, a polar bear, beautiful thing. And uh, I thought it would be nice and romantic to write a sweet little story about him for Christmas. So I knew that polar bears were big and white and they lived in the Arctic and, and that kind of thing and, and they ate seals. But I didn't know an awful lot about them. So I went to my local library and uh, d did the research. And the more I found out about them, the, the bigger my, my small Christmassy story grew. And I, you know, I sort of uh, realized that they were heavily involved in Inuit legend and I found out about how they migrated you know, across Hudson Bay and all that kind of thing. And the, sh the, sh the short story that I intended to write for my wife actually turned into a 250,000 word novel. Now that novel is still in my, what we call, a writer calls their bottom drawer. It's never, it's never come out, except that small inserts of it actually appear in um, Ice Fire in, in, in the second book. So um, I think it's important for a writer to, to, to do research, and get, especially if you're going to talk about a, a system, a, an ecological system like the Arctic, which is a very precise location to, to, to talk about. Um, and you need to know your stuff. And I watched dozens of videos and I read lots and lots of books and I talked to people who'd been there. I've never been myself. Um, so that, that helped. But with the dragons, it was, it was easy because the dragons actually, because the big fire-breathing monster type dragons don't really appear until later in the series, I didn't have to do too much research about them. And I could, obviously, I could place them wherever I wanted to in, in the world. Um, and it basically I kind of tied in the locations for the dragons into places that I knew such as the Arctic and strangely enough places in England and, and Scotland and so on and, and later moved of course to America for the American editions of the books. There are many different pathways into creativity and somebody once said to me something I've never forgotten they said there, is, there are as many different ways of writing as there are people out there doing it which is very quite profound when you think about it, but it's true. We all come at it in our, in our in different ways. I could, I could give a class of children a subject, uh, you know, and say to them, write about this, and they will all, or a scene, for instance, and they will all come at it from a, from a different angle. That's what I find fascinating, fascinating about the creative process. It's just wide open. What I always say about children, ch sorry, children, and um, children planning books particularly, or planning stories of course, they're not going to really write a book at their age, is, is this, is that children have phenomenal imaginations. They, they, they are just incredible. Again, I could give a child a scene and say, what do you think happens next? And they will come up with 10 or a dozen things that I have never thought of. And I really admire them for that. They're, they're fantastic at it. What they don't have is the um, technical ability to structure their thoughts on paper. Now we have that because, well not all of us, but <laughs> most of us have it. We, we have that at, at a later stage in life, you, you, because we, we, you read a lot of books, you learn how um, stories are paced and structured, that kind of thing. They don't have the time to develop that. So I, I do feel for teachers who are trying to teach them that kind of sense of structure. But of course, conversely, what happens with us is that as we get into adulthood, we, the responsibilities that we face kind of drain some of that imaginative um, ability that they've got. Um, so uh, I think that what you're trying to do, you know, people, uh, children's writers, for instance, will always say, um, I'm really a big kid at heart. And I think that's what they're doing. They're trying to tap back into their, imagine, you know, the imagination that they had when they were 10 years old and put themselves back into the eyes of a 10 year old again. And, works very well. Let me say something about planning books first of all. I, I, I actually told this story on, on the way here. Um, I, I was talking to a group of children once in a library and the children were asking me questions after I'd given a, a presentation. And their teacher put his hand up and he said, he said can I ask you a question? And I said yes. Uh, he said, can you tell these children how much time you spend planning a book? And I said to him, do you want the truthful answer? Or do you want the diplomatic answer? And he said, I want the truthful answer. And I said, I spend no time at all planning a book. 
and all the kids went, yes, because <laughs> of course they'd been you know, told that they, they have to plan their stories. And I sort of qualified that, but I turned to the kids and said, ah, but you do need to plan them. You know, at your age, you, you have to do this and you should pay attention to what he says. But when you get to my age, if you've, re if you've read enough books, you know, and they all went, oh. You know, kind of thing. So then you will understand the structure of the stories. Um, the books are written very organically. I usually know the beginning of the story and I have a vague idea of where I'm going to end up. Uh, it doesn't always necessarily follow, but the rest of it is a journey of adventure. And w the way I write like that is because I think if I'm discovering it spontaneously as I go along, and it's exciting me to write it down on the page, then hopefully it will just be uh, be just as exciting for anybody who's reading it off the page. So I, I, it's a dangerous way to do it because you know you've got to be. Right. What I try to do is um, leave a little cliffhanger at the en end of every chapter. And many boys and girls write to me about the cliffhangers. Say you know I got into trouble the other night because. I was reading the book in bed and my mom came up and told me to switch the light off and half an hour later I'd put the light back on again, you know, and that kind of thing. And I find that very flattering when, when children write to me and say that kind of thing. And I always write back and say, well, okay, you should do what your mom and dad say, but I like to think your parents would be happy that you are at least doing something like reading, you know, rather than playing on an Xbox or something. I think it's a great thing to read to a, a, aloud to children or adults, actually, at any age. I still like being read to aloud. You know, uh, has anybody ever, ever had an audio book in the car? You know, I, w I would say, to, you know, on long, long journeys, get an audio book of um, Harry Potter or whatever it's going to be, you know, put it in the player and let the kids listen to it. it, it, it it's, it's, it's not as good as reading, but it's almost as good. And that's one, you know, one way of in introducing them to it. Um, I once heard a lovely story actually from the Australian author Paul Jennings and he was, he was signing books and uh, a dad came up to him and said, he said, Mr Jennings, he said, will you write something in the book that will make my son read it? And he said, sure, you know, and he, he wrote that and he said, he said, dear Simon, your dad will pay you $50 if you read this book, <laughs> you know, kind of thing, which I thought was great. So bribery is very good, moms and dads uh, of, of America, but I think generally what, what you need to do, it's like with any activity, I actually don't have children, so I, I, it's hard for me to comment in some respects, so I'm no authority on it, but I, I would have thought that anything you can do where you share the activity with the child has got to be a good thing. I love the letters I get from moms and dads who sit down and actually read a book together with their child. And I even get them from uh, moms and dads who've sat down with a 12 or a 14 year old and say, we really enjoyed the book together. I think, I think that's a, a terrific thing to do. And what's nice about writing a series is that when a child gets into a series and they identify with a character, um, they can then go on and read you know, three, four, five books, whatever. And then of course they'll drive me mad. They'll, they'll read Dark Fire or something in a day and the next thing they're on the computer, when's the next one coming? <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Um, so I, I would say to, to, to moms and dads, read the book yourself, have a look at it yourself, find out what it is, you know, that it, it, you know, if, it, if it gets you interested, then there's a very good chance that it is going to get your child interested. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's no harm if a child just wants to read books about a certain subject, say ponies or, or, or whatever, there is no harm in a child reading endless books about ponies because at least they're reading and that makes a difference. And they will come to it in their own time, just like I did. And I, I, I like to think that you know, everybody will come to reading at some stage in their life. A book is a window to the world, and we can all learn so much from, from books. I write about dragons purely from a serendipitous point of view. I, I had never, ever intended to write a fantasy series at all. Uh, my first book about dragons, The Fire Within, uh, began about 10 years ago and started its life as a squirrel rescue story. Uh, I was basically asked to write an animal rescue story because I'd written a book about pigeons, which had done quite well for me. It had been shortlisted for a big prize called the Carnegie Medal. Um, and I didn't win the Carnegie, but I, I came highly commended. And the first thing a publisher will say to you, of course, is, is um, if you write a successful book on a particular sub subject, they'll always say to you, write us another one, exactly like it. So I did, I wrote a book about squirrels, and um, because I've always liked squirrels, 
Um, <clears throat> and when the book went to my publisher, my editor liked the story very much. She thought it was very charming and very English and a very sweet story. But there was one particular character in the story, um, the mom in the book called Mrs. Pennykettle. And she said, Chris, uh, what does Mrs. Pennykettle do for a job? Uh, and I said, oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. And she said, maybe you could give Mrs. Pennykettle a job. So a couple of days later, I was still wondering what job Mrs. Pennykettle could do when I went to a craft fair in Leicestershire, in England, where I live. Uh, and I met a lady who makes clay dragons. Um, and I put the clay dragons into the story, thinking this nice, quirky sort of job would be interesting in the book. And my editor picked up on it, and she liked it, and she said, let's turn it into a dragon book rather than a squirrel book. And that's how the first book came about. So, simple as that. I've written over 30 books now. But, of course, the books that I'm best known for are the series of novels called The Last Dragon Chronicles. I do write for younger readers as well, but unfortunately, many of the books that I've written for the younger age group are, are no longer available, or, or probably not available in the USA. But there is, a, um, there is a series of books called The Dragons of Wayward Crescent, which is actually just sort of coming online. Um, I was asked to write a prequel to the first of the, of the dragon novels, um, because um, the, if you read The Fire Within, which is the first book in the, in the, the Chronicles series, there is quite a jump um, in reading ability from The Fire Within up to Ice Fire, and that is largely because of the way The Fire Within evolved and changed and, and stuff. And I then went on to write pure fantasy after that kind of thing. So I decided to try and write something before The Fire Within that would uh, work as a prequel at the same kind of reading level as The Fire Within. But I couldn't get a prequel to, to work at all. And then I had the bright idea of actually writing a series about um, individual dragons. So the lady who makes the dragons in the books, Mrs. Pennykettle, um, uh, we, we have a story about uh, the various dragons that she makes and why she makes them. And these were beautiful little books, um, illustrated books as well. Um, and to, the idea is that collectively, uh, if I do the 12 or 16 that I, I want to do, they will form a prequel to The Fire Within, and they will be, um, uh, they, they will be a little thread running through them um, that will take you, kind of lip over into The, into the Fire Within. Uh, and I like those books because you, you know exactly what you're getting with The Dragons of Wayward Crescent. They're, they're, basically, the stories are roughly the same in, in format and, and structure. Um, but of course, the different dragon characters lend something different to, to each story. So they're very sweet, really aimed at sort of, oh, I don't know, seven to nine, ten-year-olds. But the interesting thing is, is that the uh, readers who've gone on to read um, the dragon novels also look back at the, <laughs> at the young books, because some of the, um, the dragons that appear in the young series also appear in the novels. So there is a kind of uh, switch over. Um, and the novels, uh, I, I guess, uh, I would say that they were sort of uh, for 10 plus upwards, but I get a lot of uh, children, sort of eight, nine-year-old, reading The Fire Within and then going on and have, really having no trouble with, with the rest of the series, even though uh, the chronicles get deeper and darker as, as they go along. Uh, they, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I think they're uh, nice adventure stories, they're very intriguing. Somebody said to me, why, why why do you, uh, is there any great influence behind the novels as, as a whole? And the, <laughs> the one influential thing is that I used to love a TV series called um, The X-Files, which I'm sure many, many Americans would, would know about. And in The X-Files, you get an awful lot of intrigue, but you don't get many answers. And that's kind of the way the, the, the dragon uh, novels are framed. They're very intriguing. And, and it drives the kids mad, mad because they say to me, yeah, but what does this mean? I, I, I love the books, but what does this mean? <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, um, but they will always go on and read them. And so th those, those are there to, to test your mind, you know, to stretch the, the minds of the, of the children who read them, I think. Whereas the Dragons of Wayward Crescent are very much there just to sort of say, so these are sweet books that you can read with your eight-year-old and or your eight-year-old can read alone kind of thing. So they're, they're just very standard but lovely books, whereas the Dragon novels are there to really blow your mind apart in, in, in some respects. 
Fly Cherokee Fly um, is the book that really led me into writing about dragons. And when I, when I talk about this in schools, I usually use a PowerPoint presentation. And I say to the children, I put up a slide that says, what inspired me to write about dragons? And they will all put their hands up and they'll all have their various answers. And then, of course, I put up a picture of a pigeon and they all go, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Basically, I, I, uh, I was walking across my local park one day and I saw a pigeon fluttering about in the bushes, having trouble taking off. Now, I'm very soft-hearted and I, I can't bear to see an animal in distress. So I went across to this pigeon, picked it up and held it in my hands and it was very distressed and quite filthy, it had been in all sorts of muddy puddles and things, and it had broken a wing. So I, I took it to a veterinary surgeon across the road and asked if there was anything we could do for it. And the veterinary surgeon looked at it and he shook his head and he said, oh, he said, that's going to die within two days. The kindest thing you can do is put it back on the park, leave it to die, let nature take its course kind of thing. So I went to put it back and I got back to the place where I picked the bird up and I thought to myself, I can't do this. So I took it home with me instead. <laughs> and I actually nursed it back to health. I kept him for three months in a shed at the bottom of my garden. And uh, one day I went in to feed uh, this pigeon and um, he was up in the rafters of the shed. It started to fly again. So I said to my, I went into the house and I said to my wife, Jay, I said, I, I said Jay, you won't believe this. I said, um, uh, we called him Gregory Peck, by the way. <laughs> you should know this. <laughs> Sorry, American. But, um, so I said, you won't believe this. I said, Greg has started to fly again. So she said, great, we'll, we'll, we'll take him back to the park. We'll let him go where we found him. So we took him back up the road the next day, about a mile away from the house, threw him up into the trees. Went, Bye, Greg, have a nice life, kind of thing. He landed on the branch of a tree and we watched him turn around and coo at some other pigeons, kind of thing. We walked back home, got into the house and Jay said to me, um, would you like a cup of tea? And I said, yes. And she went into the kitchen. She said, Chris, come here a minute. I went, what? She pointed through the kitchen window like this. She said, Greg's just landed on the shed roof. <laughs> so I thought, ah, right, I'm going to have to take him away a bit further. So the next day, I put him in a shoebox on the passenger seat of my car. Sorry, it's this way for you, isn't it? <laughs> on the passenger seat of my car. <laughs> Drove about 50 miles up the road with him. Let him go in the countryside. Watched him for a couple of minutes, pecking around with some other pigeons. Got back into the car, drove back home. By the time I got home, he was back on the shed roof. So we knew we weren't going to be able to let him go. So I ended up keeping him. And I wrote a story about him and I thought, well, this is a nice idea, a nice idea for a story because uh, this is what authors do, basically. We take experiences from our lives and we pop them into books. So I just transposed myself into a 12-year-old boy um, who finds this pigeon. And the only thing I changed about it was um, that the pigeon turned out to be a racing pigeon. And um, the boy tries to find out who the racing pigeon belongs to and it gets him into all sorts of trouble at school and, and stuff with a bully. Um, and the book was very well received, you know, people liked it very much. It was shortlisted for a big prize called the Carnegie Medal, uh, which is kind of the equivalent of your Newbery Medal, I think. And I did, although I didn't win, um, it was highly commended. Um, and that's really, it was because of that, my, my profile sh zoomed, you know, uh, because of that. And that was really what got me into writing about the Dragon books after that, because I went on, I was allowed to go on and write other novels about you know um, other animals and and develop that that sort of writing path well let me say something about the fire within first of all the first book because i like teachers to read the fire within for one particular reason because it is not really a book about squirrels it's not really a book about dragons it's actually a book about creativity and where ideas come from because in the stories, um, basically the, 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 the dragon stories are, uh, you, you begin in The Fire Within by meeting this lady, Mrs. Pennykettle, who makes little clay dragons that can come to life. All these dragons have some kind of special ability. The most important of them, the one that all the kids write to me about, is a dragon called Gadzooks, who is made for David um, as, uh, as a gift, basically. And Gadzooks, of course, can come to life. He's a special dragon, as she calls him. And Gadzooks' particular ability is to write things down. He has a notepad and a pencil. And when Lucy's birthday comes around, Lucy is uh, Mrs. Pennykettle's daughter, David, because he's a kind man, he wants to give her a present for her birthday. But because he's a college student, he's not got much money, 
So he decides to do something rather unusual for her, which is to write a story for her for her birthday. And he writes a story about a squirrel that they're trying to rescue in the garden. But of course, every time David gets stuck with his story, what happens is that Gadzooks, the dragon, who's sitting on the windowsill looking out um, into the garden, um, comes to life um, and writes something down on his notepad. And whatever Gadzooks writes on his notepad gets David started again with his story. So Gadzooks is an inspirational writing dragon. But what really fires the series off from there as well is that the things that Gadzooks writes on his notepad appear to come true. So it's as if this dragon can predict the future. And as you go into the second, third, fourth, fifth books, this theme, this creativity theme is developed, if you like, alongside the theme of uh, dragons and their existence. Now these creatures uh, seem to have fascinated people all the way down the years. All sorts of different cultures love them. And they will, they, they've sprung up around about the same time, you know, all over the world. And no one really knows why. And there is no proof of their existence. So in the books, what I'm actually trying to do is uh, A, prove that dragons do exist or, or, or sort of lead people into stories that might make people think that, that dragons actually existed. But I'm also exploring the idea of creativity and where we um, as a race and the universe actually came from as well. Because when you think about it, someone asked me once about the Big Bang and they, they, they said, you know, in the, in, in the book Firestar, which is the third book in the series, one of the characters, um, a chap called Arthur, ha has a, a vision or a dream where he sees a dragon actually breathe out and that creates the universe sort of thing. Nice, nice story, all right? But when you think about it, it is quite an interesting thing, quite an interesting concept because you go back to the, the, the Big Bang or whatever, the creation of the universe, you know, most scientists will accept that, you know, there was an explosion um, and oh, everything that we see around us uh, actually came from the stuff of that explosion. And of course, an explosion, you know, you get a huge fire kind of thing. And what's the one creature in the world that breathes fire? A dragon, you know, or, or, or as legend would have it. So that kind of led me into the path of, of, of writing about uh, the universe itself and where, where it was created from and, and how everything links together and how consciousness and creativity links together. Um, and so the books explore that whole path. But of course, what I'm trying to do ultimately is, is just look at the whole uh, dragon existence thing and say, well, can we actually sort of say anything about these creatures? You know, did, were they real? Did they live? You know, where's the proof for them? So in the stories, of course, I make up proof of them. And if I read a section from Darkfire, then um, I can um, hopefully prove it to your, your readers. You know. I'm Crystal Lacey, and what I'm going to do now is read to you a small section from my latest book, Dark Fire. Now, these books um, come from a series of books called The Last Dragon Chronicles. Um, and in the Chronicles, I'm basically trying to say something about um, the proof of the existence of dragons. Now, in this particular section that I'm going to read, I deal with one character who is one of my favorite characters in the books, um, a man called Anders Bergstrom. Now Bergstrom is a brilliant scientist and in 1913 he gets himself invited onto an Arctic field trip to investigate a place called the Heller Glacier in the far north in the, in the high Arctic. Now Bergstrom's particular speciality is geology. So he goes to look at the mountains to either side of the glacier and he finds a cave there. And Bergstrom being the kind of man that he is goes into the cave um, shines his lights around to see what, you know, anything of interest, geological interest. And he finds some very strange marks on the walls of the cave. And he's not sure what these marks are. He thinks at first maybe they're made by water erosion on the rocks caused, you know, by the formation of the glacier many thousands or millions of years ago. But his heart tells him that maybe this is actually something a little more unusual. So he sets up his lights and he takes lots and lots of photographs of these marks and then gathers up his equipment and makes his way back to his camp. But on the way back to his camp, he has an encounter with a male polar bear. And rather foolishly, Bergstrom's come out of his camp with no kind of weapon. And there he is, stranded alone on the ice 
with a male polar bear just 20 or 30 yards ahead of him. Now the accepted thing to do in this situation these days is to take off an item of clothing, put it down on the ice in front of you and hope that your clothing, the scent of your clothing will distract the bear for long enough for you to be able to get away. But what Bergstrom does is he takes an old pocket watch out of his jacket and he puts that down on the ice in front of him, opens up the watch and it starts to tick. The bear comes padding up towards the watch, Bergstrom backs off very, very slowly. The bear stops at the watch, is distracted by the ticking and Bergstrom makes his escape to his camp. But he's lost his watch. So 20 minutes later, he comes back to the site where he put the watch down, this time with a rifle, hoping that the watch will still be where he left it, that the bear's not mauled it or trodden on it or anything like that. And sure enough, there is the watch exactly where he left it, but there's the bear as well, still sitting there. This time, sitting up like a cat, very erect, very proud. The wind is whistling round this bear's ears. And Bergstrom now knows that this is no ordinary encounter with a polar bear. And this is what happens. Bergstrom drew to within 20 feet of the bear and stopped. He lowered his gun, then pushed back the fraying hood of his jacket and tore off his balaclava. He shook his hair loosely about his shoulders. It was straggly, almost golden, highlighted by catches of glinting frost. You've got my watch, he said. The bear cast its almond eyes down at the timepiece, still ticking despite the cold, and the bear spoke. It said, you may have it back if you come with me, Anders Bergstrom. Bergstrom looked all around him before returning his focus to the bear. Are you a spirit? He asked it. Sometimes, the bear said, lifting its chin. I am Torin, the first bear to walk this ice. And what is it you want with me, Torin? To commingle with your Orma, the ice bear said so that you might take me to the hearts of men. I will show you great wonders in return. Bergstrom switched his rifle to the opposite hand. Why have you chosen me, he said. Because of what you have seen in the caves, said the bear. Bergstrom nodded. The marks on the walls, they're writings, aren't they? The bear pointed its black-tipped snout into the wind. They are a record of a meeting, it said. The marks are the words of dragons. Thank you.